sounds good. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for having us. We have, we have done, uh, as Sally was talking about, in prior years we have done um, a video conference uh, twice a year for the fellows and for just the community at large too. It's just an interesting case where we're able to go over a case and have a little bit of discussion afterwards and then kind of open it up to a greater discussion uh, from the group. And, and since this is more in the fellow format, you know, I think it's can be a little bit more informal and then, you know, questions can, can abound afterwards and we can all discuss it. Um, we'd like somewhere kind of around a 15 minutes or so of the presentation with a little bit of faculty discussion afterwards, and then we can move along to kind of open it up to questions and everything from there. Um, we have, uh, three presenters today, which we're very thankful for their help today. We have, uh, uh Kim, and I don't know if it's Ramanel or Ramanel. And, However you'd like to say it. <laughs> all right. And Rashi Gartland and Adi Shirali uh, presenting today. And uh, in random order, we'll go with Kim first. Everybody good on screen, seeing and sharing? Excellent. So um, the case I'm going to present today, it's, um, it's actually the, oh, I'm sorry, what was it? Oh, the, the banality of it is um, actually what I think find so interesting about it. Um, a lot of us are going to be in this position in just a few short months. And um, it's a, a good thought process on operative management of um, uh, two synchronous processes that we'll likely see in the future. So this is a 66-year-old female. She presented to an outside hospital in February of last year with a small bowel obstruction. She had multiple intraluminal distal small bowel lesions on her scan concerning for malignant obstruction. Her past medical history is listed here. She's diabetic, a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, a remote history of a GI bleed and long-standing reflux. She's had a THBSO in the past and her medications are listed here. So she, her outside CT scan, um, I'll scroll through it really quickly. So she has uh, no evidence of lesions in her liver. You can see some mildly dilated small bowel. And as we progress distally to the pelvis, there's a prominent loop of small bowel that you can see with some decompressed distal loops here. And then you start seeing some um, arterial enhancing mucosal lesions within the wall of her distal small bowel. As we get down to this transition point in the pelvis is when it really becomes uh, prominent where she has multiple lesions throughout her small bowel here. Uh, that day when she presented at the outside hospital, she underwent an emergent x lap. She had about 10 centimeters of a distal ileum that was respect, resected. A uh, primary stapled small bowel anastomosis was performed. The outside surgeon in his operative note commented that he, she had intraluminal studying, um, basically palpated throughout her and distal jejunum entire ileum at the time of operation. And they only resected uh, the site of obstruction and transition point during that operation. On pathology, she had multi multifocal, well-differentiated grade one neuroendocrine tumor of her small bowel. The largest focus was 1.6 centimeters, and she had one mesenteric node that was positive for a PT2N1 um, MX neuroendocrine tumor of her small bowel. She recovered slowly, uneventfully, discharged home on postoperative day 12. And then she was referred to our endocrine surgery clinic in August of that year uh, for residual multifocal small bowel and neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, her referral was delayed just through COVID pandemic. Um, and uh, she had been doing well since the operation. She had no carcinoid symptoms. Her workup with us just really brief and abbreviated um, in the highlights here. She had a serum calcium of 10.5, which looking back through her records, was about her nadir. She had anywhere from a 10.5 um, up to 10.7 with a PTH of 80. This is the first time it had ever been checked. Uh, in a, a normal body. She had normal renal function, GFR greater than 60, and her chromogran A and her gastrin level elevated, although she's been on chronic PPI therapy. And so to further work her up, we, um, and to see the burden of disease from a neuroendocrine standpoint, we got a dotatate scan, which I'll scroll through here. So she has normal uh, physiologic uptake throughout her liver, her spleen, her kidneys, and her adrenal glands bilaterally. And as we progress distally, you can see she has right here a really avid hot area on her um, jejunum and then into her ileum, there's more avidity in a very focused pattern. She has, I believe, one area in her small bowel that was a little more avid, or so, sorry, small bowel mesentery. 
And then uh, this is just a, a 3D reconstruction of planar film and the coronal cut of, you can see all of her avid nodules throughout her small bowel and no evidence of disease within her liver. So we had two problems that need to be addressed. One was her low grade small bowel. She had multifocal um, residual disease throughout her small bowel with an avid mesenteric node. However, there was no evidence of distant metastatic disease. So it was basically localized to her small bowel. And then this incidental normal hormonal primary hyperparathyroidism. And so we started discussing what are our thoughts on management? Um, I don't know how interactive this session normally is. Wanted to throw it out to the audience, um, not to be in like a pimping um, session or anything, but what are our thoughts on management? How would we address this? Anybody go for preoperative parathyroid imaging? What would be our operative approach? Do we do the synchronous combined staged? Oh, I don't want to answer any of your questions. What was that, Tiffany? Oh. Sorry, I thought someone said something. Okay. Yeah, we can go ahead. Or if you feel bold enough, we can just call someone out from the audience if you want. Uh, there was one lesson I learned early on in training is that you don't go like lateral, <laughs> you go down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, let's go ahead and keep going and we'll, okay, great. we'll kind of go towards it. Yeah. So, um, after some discussions with the patient, with our team, um, we decided to proceed with a synchronous approach for her. So we staged this in a matter of doing her parathyroid operation first. Um, it's a clean procedure. We had to wait on IOPTHs. So from an efficiency standpoint, um, we staged it to where we did a parathyroid exploration first. Um, we do a radio guided approach, um, just a little bit of background on how we do this. So preoperatively patients are injected with 10 millicuries of sestamibi in preoperative uh, holding area. We don't get any additional imaging beyond that. We use a handheld neoprobe. Um, we set a background count on the thyroid isthmus and then we use any resected tissue. Um, we perform an XVO count greater than 20% of the background is consistent with the hyperplastic parathyroid tissue. And so um, we found four gland hyperplasia, which is not surprising um, in her. All of her parathyroid glands were small, but they were hot on radionucleotide uptake. Uh, they were all four uh, visualized. We did a three and a half gland resection. We left a right lower remnant with a proline suture marker. And then we also performed a bilateral cervical thymectomy in her, um, given that we were concerned for possible MEN1 syndrome. And we'll talk a little bit about, about that in the end in terms of genetic testing. We closed her neck. We left the derma bond um, off, just of course, waiting for her IOPTHs. And so um, then we proceeded to her X lab while we waited for her values. And so just a reminder, this is kind of, this is my little shorthand visualization for um, when I write on my little notes, what we do for her next. We did a three and a half gland. We left a right lower remnant and then we took her bilateral uh, thigh mine. And this is what her IOPTH did. So she had a baseline of 67. Uh, five minute was 67.1, 10 minute was 66, 15 minute was 66.2, and 45 minute was 66.4, which we obtained another specimen, of course, after the um, five, 10, and 15 minutes started coming in. And so this is kind of, I wouldn't say your worst nightmare, but this is not the optimal um, IOPTH trend you'd like to see in the OR. And this presented us with a little bit of problem. So um, we discussed, do we go back in the neck? We had clearly visualized all four glands. We took both of her thymus, just the fact that she had maybe has a supernumerary gland, a fifth gland that we had not seen, um, but her levels were so low, the risk of making her hypopara um, crippling her was uh, certainly greater than the risk of curing her. So we elected to not return to her neck and we proceeded um, with her x lap. And so she had about 10 to 12 small mobile tumors within the distal jejunum and proximal ileum with the largest conglomerate right at her prior anastomosis. Uh, there was no large mesenteric mass. We did, um, did take two enlarged lymph nodes within her mesentery that was included in the resected specimen and uh, about 35 centimeters in total instead of stapled anastomosis. We uh, surveyed her abdomen, of course, upon entry, uh, specifically looking at her liver, um, if there was any obvious evidence of large tumor burden, um, but it was nice and clean and normal. And so we elected to uh, not proceed with a cholecystectomy at the time that we had discussed in the event that she needed long-term uh, land therapy. 
Um, so the next thing that was um, kind of interesting, I put in my little pocketbook for future experiences as you uh, attending in the next few months is the post-operative management of after a soap total parathyroidectomy for somebody who's NPO. So um, not surprising, we initiated her, initiated her on IV calcium gluconate three grams daily um, from a supplementation standpoint, which is about equivalent to what we do in a PO patient uh, prophylactically when they send them home. And so post-op day one, um, her, I checked her PTH in the morning and it fell to 35. And then just for academic purposes and my own curiosity, um, her PTH fell to 16 the subsequent day. Um, so we actually um, presented this back to our PTH uh, lab, our IO PTH lab, whether they had a, a miscalibration on the machine that day or and continued to run the same sample over and over and over again, and therefore did not detect the drop in her PTH that um, had occurred. Or whether she was just a delayed clearance. She's a middle-aged female with normal renal function, so I would suspect her to have normal clearance. Um, so we were a little bit uh, sabotaged unexpectedly by potential um, machine failure. And thankfully we didn't go back in the neck and um, render her hypopara. So they said there was machine failure or there was not? No, they said there was not, that they, that they, but they theorized the only possible explanation they could have is that there was residual um, sample left from the prior runs. No, you, people can be slow degraders, and particularly in MEN1. It can, that, I've seen that. Certainly. It's certainly possible. Um, you know, I, I can't explain why she would drop 24 hours later to another half other than being a slow clear. That's all right. Go on. Good job. Keep going. So she discharged her home on day four. She did great, tolerated regular diet, good bowel function. We put her on oral supplementation. And then two weeks post-op, her calcium is 9.9 .9 and PTH is 58. She's due for her six month labs this March. So we'll see what she's doing from a cure standpoint. Um, and then for just her final pathology review, nothing surprising here. Um, benign thymic tissue, and then three and a half glands. She had a 2.2 centimeter largest focus of her um, grade two neuroendocrine tumor uh, with a pathologic stage of T2N1. And she did remarkably well. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Go back the, to the path. Mm -hmm. So 40 milligrams is a normal gland. Was that a portion of a gland? Part C? Uh, nope, that was her, her normal gland. They were small little fireballs, I call them. <laughs> okay, so that calls the question of multiglandular disease into question because 40 is normal, but... Did, and 10 was the remnant, part F? Yep. So that's why it's 10 milligrams, because it was on IC, got it. Okay, go on. And so things to consider for her from a next management, or next step in management and surveillance standpoint. So from a possible MEN1 -E standpoint, um, she never was genetically tested preoperatively. She does not have children. Um, we discussed it with her, we offered it to her from a financial standpoint. It wasn't reasonable for her at this time, but um, it's something that she'd consider pursuing in the future. From a surgical standpoint, we treated her like it, and at least in the neck, um, give, knowing that she wouldn't um, have the funds for genetic testing. Um, and then when we see her in follow-up, um, we'll pursue uh, prolactin level and pituitary imaging, and then we'll repeat her surveillance imaging from a neuroendocrine standpoint in a few months, as we will with labs from her primary hyperparathyroidism standpoint. And so um, nothing groundbreaking or shattering here, but it was um, a lot of interesting discussions amongst our team and, um, and what to do when your normal steps fail you, not fail you, but um, don't really proceed as normal and just kind of sticking to your basics. I think that is all I have there. I'm happy to discuss further. Dr. Lindemann, I know is on this call and she was the attending um, with uh, me on this case. And Dr. Romanel did an amazing job with all aspects of it. So excellent work on the presentation as well. It's in the mail, don't worry. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was great uh, presentation, Julie. Really. A um, couple comments. So yeah, I mean, I, I would definitely agree. You know, you don't wanna go do crazy having seen the, the three that you removed. And it sounds like they're not you know, super big. You don't wanna go 
overboard, right? I mean, you know, uh, I think uh, I would rather in this, because her pre-op DTH was like 81 or something like that. Mm -hmm. She wasn't like, you know, rip roaring with, you know, really aggressive disease. So I, I commend you for being, for sitting on your hands and, and doing the right thing. Um, quick question about the uh, IV calcium. Uh, was that by drip or was that, um, was that uh, intermittent boluses? What was the way that you did it? It's intermittent infusions. She got about a gram um, spaced out over a few hours throughout the day. Yeah, and that's fine. I mean, I would say um, you have to be careful if you give it like too quickly, you can, uh, you can really mess up a vein. And right. then in this case, she wasn't profoundly hypocalcemic, but in the patients who are profoundly hypocalcemic, if you give it too much in a bolus, then it just kind of goes up and then comes right back down. Then you're going to want to give the trip. But in this case, over a couple hours, I think was was great. Uh, until got her GI function back. Gram over an hour is kind of the the rough calculation we use here. Yeah, thank you, Kim. Um, a couple of questions for you, Dr. Lindemann. Um, just could you talk a little bit more about, I guess the the order and the timing of uh, kind of working up the diagnosis, maybe when there was a little bit of suspicion of MEN1, um, potentially, you know, doing pituitary imaging on the front end or even pancreatic imaging or in the front end when we have an elevated gastrin level, um, kind of the thought process through all that. Um, and then, you know, uh, potentially um, uh, decision-making behind uh, doing the procedure as a combined procedure instead of separating out, you know, parathyroid and, and um, small bowel surgery? Yeah, so um, a few different aspects went into the decision making in terms of doing a combined procedure. Uh, some of it was financially driven from her end. Um, she's a little bit um, resource um, stringent. And so we wanted to be mindful of that, given her one admission, one operation, one shot under anesthesia. And for an operation that we knew wasn't gonna create a whole lot of physiologic changes in her from a hemodynamic standpoint, that she'd be able to heal well um, from both aspects with this combined procedure. Um, and then in terms of timing for additional workup, so she had had her history of GI bleed, uh, being on chronic PPI, she had had scopes in the past. Um, you know, her gastro is something that will follow. Um, I don't know if she'll ever be able to be off PPI for a prolonged time to really get a true gastrin level, but she has been scoped in the past and it's been normal um, after her episodes of GI bleeding. And then the, the prolactin and pituitary uh, imaging will certainly is something that will play a role in her follow-up. Um, I, I believe she had had an imaging of her head prior a while ago um, that was normal, but it was just a CT and not necessarily an MRI pituitary. And then the, the only thing that I would add to that is just to say that um, she'd had a CT of her abdomen that did not reveal any pancreatic lesions. And then we followed that up with a gallium dotatate scan. And that also didn't, so I guess that's a longer way of saying that we worked up her pancreas at the same time that we were working up her small bowel lesions from um, a structural point of view. And then she was additionally asymptomatic from a potential pituitary concern. Um, and so we discussed it, but ultimately decided to defer the head imaging until the post-operative setting when, you know, she could sort of manage that a little bit better um, and things settled out. I think doing them together is fine, especially given her physical constraints. And um, I know that um, y'all at uh, MD Anderson Paul are have the capability to get genetic testing instantly and and you routinely get it pre-op but I don't do that um, I tell I mean it depends what what test you get depends what you find in terms of um, jaw tumor syndrome and so forth so I routinely tell patients at risk for MEN1 that if they have multiglandular disease if they have hyperplasia for gland disease at parathyroid expiration then we're going to get the the uh, pituitary and pancreas imaging. And sometimes they luck out and they don't need it. Often, actually. Lynn, what do you think? I agree. I mean, some of the, our, our genetic counselors have um, actually made an effort to try to make things a little bit more streamlined. 
in terms of getting things. So it depends on what you're suspecting and how, you know, I mean, if someone shows up with like some, you know, big old jaw tumor or some uh, things like that, I think you have to go down that road, but I don't make a hard stop that you have to stop, you know, that you have to like get all this information before doing the operation. If there's I a, want to see. Fun. I want to see you, Sabine. That's Kate's kid. Um, anyway, so yeah, so I, I, Sorry. I would like to, to take it on a, um, from a uh, kind of um, case by case basis. Hi, this is Lynn. My only other comment would be to, um, in addition to MEN1, is to think about MEN4. So that's caused by the CTKN1B gene, and sometimes that can be associated with um, small bowel uh, neuroendocrine tumors as well. And so um, if she's going to end up getting screened, I would screen her for that as well. Sorry, Lynn, I didn't realize she was calling on you and not me. So I heard she was calling on, <laughs> on you. That was so okay. Though. Good. Lynn is the only person with a shorter name than mine. I'm seven letters. <laughs> so, sorry. <laughs> Excellent. Those are all great comments, and thank you for everyone for coming. Um, is there any other questions? Uh, in the meanwhile, we have Dr. Garland set up her presentation. Yep, we'll do. Perfect. Are you able to see that? We are. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I can start whenever. Um, okay, well, um, today I thought I'd discuss um, a case of parathyroid carcinoma. Um, this isn't necessarily a zebra case, but likely something that we'll encounter throughout our careers and we'll need to know how to manage. Um, so I'm lucky today to be joined by two experts, Dr. Carrie Lubitz, who is a surgeon on the case, and then um, our lead pathologist, Dr. Peter Sadow, um, who's been pretty, a really extraordinary teacher to me throughout the years. Um, so this case um, involves a 59-year-old man with Crohn's disease, uh, first on chronic steroids, then transitioned to Remicade, who is noted to have a two-year history of elevated calcium levels, uh, evidence of osteoporosis on bone scan, and elevated PTH. In clinic, he denied any complaints of polydipsia, polyuria, constipation, fatigue, weakness, arthralgias, or bone pain. He denied depression, ulcers, pancreatitis, fractures, nephrolithiasis. Um, he had no pertinent family or medication history and had no history of prior head or neck radiation. Aside from Crohn's and osteoporosis, he was also obese um, with hyperlipidemia and BPH. Uh, his medications were notable for vitamin D supplement, a PPI, an alpha-1 alpha blocker, and Remicade. Um, and on exam, he had no palpable thyromegaly, um, no masses or nodules, and his trachea was midline. His labs were notable um, for calciums ranging from 9.9 .9 to 10.2, a 24-hour urine calcium of 644, a PTH of 159, um, and vitamin D level within normal limits. A DEXA scan was performed um, before his clinic visit and demonstrated osteoporosis um, of both the lumbar spine and then osteopenia of the left femoral neck. He had an ultrasound in clinic, uh, which demonstrated a 1.2 centimeter nodule uh, posterior to the right thyroid, hypoechoic, um, and consistent with a parathyroid adenoma. Uh, he also had a nine millimeter left posterior thyroid nodule without worrisome features. Um, and given all of this workup, he was booked for a parathyroidectomy. Unfortunately, this was delayed several months in the setting of um, our Massachusetts COVID-19 surge, um, which seems to be the theme for today. And then in the operating room, he was found to have an enlarged locally invasive mass encapsulating the right recurrent laryngeal nerve. There was no positive stimulation of the recurrent laryngeal nerve or vagus nerve throughout the case. A frozen section demonstrated parathyroid tissue with atypia and extensive um, fibrosis. And given concern for parathyroid carcinoma, a radical parathyroidectomy was performed with resection of the right thyroid lobe and, a right and the right central uh, neck lymph nodes. The other parathyroid on the right side was not clearly identified, and the intraoperative PTH dropped from 121 to 20 after excision. So hang on. To yes. clarify, you, you noticed that it was wrapped around the nerve, which had no signal, and you resected the nerve. 
yeah, it was not able to be. Um, That's fine. But, I yeah. can respond, Rajri, because. Yeah, I, I, I know you were, you were probably going to talk more about the case after. Yeah. You could either do it now or whenever. This would be a good time. I have to respond to Dr. Cardi. <laughs> of course. Ex-president. Um, hi, Sally. Um, hi. So, um, <laughs> this was a um, surprise. Uh, so uh, it was horrifying. Um, Everything that happened with, um, hi everybody, Carrie Lubitz, endocrine surgeon, Mass General. Um, I, um, yeah, I, this was, I, you know, postponed it because I didn't think, you know, I, his urinary calcium was so high. I, yeah, that was worrisome, but his, you know, calcium wasn't super high, his PTH wasn't high. So when we, when we, um, stratified people for who were people who were going to be postponed or not, I put them in the category of elective. And so there was nothing that I thought was, I, I did the ultrasound myself. It looked like a, a usual adenoma, hypoechoic, nothing weird about it. Um, and so I postponed it. And then when I ultrasound it, one thing you didn't have, Rashi, because you know, at, at Danvers, I, 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 I actually bring the ultrasound over pre-op again. Right. Um, and uh, I didn't, I don't, I didn't document it, but I knew pre-op. I'm like, this is different than what it looked like a few months ago. And I, I knew there was something different and I didn't know if it was me and that maybe I didn't do it correctly, um, but it looked heterogeneous. It did not look like a, an adenoma anymore. And I was like, oh no, excuse my French. Oh shit. Like maybe this was just a posterior tubercle papillary that I missed. And so I was like, uh, okay. Um, and, but his PTH was still not that high in the interoperative PTH. So, um, when I got in there, I was at an, and, and Sally, you'll appreciate this. I was at an outpatient facility because most of the end, uh, originally, you know, a lot of our cases have been moved to outpatient facilities. Um, no, um, uh, I still have interoperative PTH and all the, everything that I need, but it was just, um, it was just Kelly clamps and that's all, huh? Kelly clamps and that's it. Yeah, and you know, no, no, I, 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 and I'm, and I mean that it was just, it was, it was something when I got in there, and I was like, um, and fortunately, I had Sean Wren at the time. I don't know if Sean's not on the call now, but he was a fellow last year. And fortunately, normally I have no residents, and I was like, is this right? I'm gonna have to sacrifice this guy's nerve. I mean, I went in there with a PTH of 120, and I was like, I have to take this guy's nerve today and take out his thyroid. And I, you know, it was, it was unexpected to say the least. And um, I think he's like a psychologist or something. And he talks all the time. It was just, and I, but I, I did it. And, and fortunately, uh, anyway, so yeah. So sometimes. So for those in, uh, listening at all levels of training, taking the nerve is a big deal. You know, we don't have a lot of big deals in endocrine surgery and it's, I had to do it two weeks ago and Lynn had to scrub it and talk me into it. You know, fuck me up. <laughs> it was for recurrent papillary, bad with turt and everything, but it's a big deal. Visceral response. We all empathize with you, Dr. Lovitz. Sorry, my- Sorry, thank you. Yeah, yeah teenager just walked in and decided to keep real. Oh, it's what God. <laughs> <laughs> Brunette was asking if he was horse pre-op. Was he horse pre-op? He wasn't. He wasn't. So, and it was weird. And, and under, what under what circumstances would you say, I'm sorry, sir, for your mild hyperparathyroidism, your ultrasound findings have changed. I think we should do the surgery next week at the main facility. Um, maybe, but that wasn't at the time was still not available. And, and, and quite honestly, I didn't at that time with his PTH, because we've been taught, you know, like parathyroid carcinoma, it was my first as a, an attending I'm 10, 11 years out. Um, I had oh, seen this them is an in old the case. Fellow. I see. Huh? This is an old case. <laughs> no, no, no. Common this tumor. Is I'm it's just not saying, a common tumor. It's not an old case. It's I'm just saying how rare it is for me, yeah. at least for me. Um, and so, you know, I've been taught, you know, PTH is in the thousands and their calciums are 12, 13. And, you know, so it, it didn't even cross my mind to tell you the truth. And, 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 and that's so. the other teaching point is it's the, 
it's the surgeon's job to get in there and say, whoa, this is a white rock hard mess that's stuck to everything around it. I suspect parathyroid cancer. I'm not yeah. gonna make a hole in it and wipe it all over the neck. I'm gonna do on block resection like a real endocrine surgeon and save this patient's life, which is what happens, then it doesn't recur. So you I have to recognize, yep. <laughs> you have to recognize <laughs> it on the spot. did the right thing? <laughs> yeah, you did the right thing, yeah. 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 Awesome. Yeah, so so if I think the one thing I would say is if you it is hard to take a nerve. And I'll tell all of the fellows I've had to take, I don't know, a bunch, and I'm sure Sally's taken a ton more than me. But when you take a nerve purposefully, it hurts. It hurts every time. And you have to be 100 percent sure. But this is a time when I was like, okay, is PTH is 120, maybe it's just inflamed but I just knew it. I just knew it was wrong. And it, and so I did it. And so sometimes you have to trust your intuition and you will develop that over time. That's all I can say. Great. Um, thank you for your time. <laughs> Thanks. Um, now, <laughs> that shadow has taught me more about parathyroids, thyroids and adrenal glands than anyone at surgeon or endocrinologist that I know. So please, Dr. Sadow, my, one of my best friends in the world, <laughs> Please so, enlighten us. So this this ended up being an 1100 um, milligram parathyroid. So it's it's, it's actually you know, obviously quite large, and this is a, a low power view of the of the histopathology. So what you can see essentially are nodular cellular areas with uh, broad pink the bright pink bands of fibrosis intervening in those areas. So already at at, at this point it's at a minimum for a pathologist, this, this is an atypical adenoma. And what is an atypical adenoma? It essentially is parathyroid tissue with broad bands of fibrosis. So, that, so that's it. Now, the other thing that's really important for you all to know is your communication with the pathologist is of utmost importance because you know part of our diagnosis is based on the feedback that you provide to us. So if, if Carrie Lubitz calls you in a panic, and says, I'm about to take out this person's nerve, then you already know there's a problem to begin with. So, so you have to have that type of communication because if you don't tell the pathologist the information, they're not going to give you back the information that you need specifically. So, so here we know we have a, an extremely you large- You want me to say it was in Danver, so a community, like Peter wasn't there. I wasn't like speed dialing Peter. It was this poor community pathologist. And I'm like, um, can you, I have a really interesting case for you. And he actually, the guy who read it was fantastic. Was it Mark? To, oh, to start alert? naming names of people from community hospitals. Oh, sorry. But he actually said there is a nerve running through. Like he actually, yeah. he helped me. Yes, Mark Tulecki. That's his name. Yeah. So then, um, all right. So next one, Roger Shree. So this is an area where you see the bands of fibrosis. Um, and then the other thing you see is in the middle of the pink, you'll start seeing these little brown crumblets. You can see that there. That's hemosiderin, hemosiderin deposition. So you know that there's been hemorrhage within this within this gland, which again is a sign of rapid growth of the parathyroid tissue. And as all of you know, um, with parathyroids, knowing that you can take a piece of it and shove it back into the arm and have it grow fine is that that parathyroids specifically are very vascular tissues and have a, a, a very uh, keen way of developing their own blood supply. So hemorrhage in rapidly growing parathyroid lesions is actually quite common. Uh, uh, if you look directly northeast of that, you actually see parathyroid tissue, which essentially is sitting inside a blood vessel and there. Yep. So right in the center there, you see parathyroid tissue in the middle of that blood vessel, which I actually don't think I commented on the pathology report, but that's actually a lymphatic invasion of, of the parathyroid tissue, which is even more of a, uh, an indication that this is a malignant uh, lesion. But oftentimes, because these lesions are so vascular, it's a little bit difficult unless it's going into a very large vessel to uh, account for lymphatic or vascular invasion and parathyroid tissue. Okay, next slide. And this is the, this is the piece of resistance that actually provided this diagnosis. Is, so what you can see is a nodule uh, in the top right or mid right of the section, this very large, yes, um, light gray nodule that's there. And that is a, the gigantic nerve. <laughs> so that you see there is the nerve and surrounding that nerve swallowing that nerve is this parathyroid tissue. Um, you know, pathologists are pretty good at finding per, uh, perineural invasion. Uh, you can be, 
a patient walking into the floor of the hospital and be able to recognize the size of this nerve. It's an enormous nerve. There's absolutely no injury. And, uh, and so this is like a straightforward, huge nerve. You could not have saved that nerve. You could have not scraped this off of that nerve. There's no possible way to save that nerve. Next. And this is just a higher power where you can see that the, it's not only surrounding the nerve, but actually in the bottom left corner of the of the nerve, you can actually see the parathyroid in going into the perineurium. So it's actually invading into the nerve. So this is uh, this is this in, invasion into the nerve. There's no there's no benign process that can do this. So this like, is a, this, he called this, me at six p.m. seven p.m. on a Friday and he said, "It's stop okay." Drinking. You did the right thing. I said, "Stop <laughs> drinking." <laughs> That's a great uh, photo. Really great. Yeah. Okay, next one. And this is again, the, this is showing that this is showing the parathyroid tissue directly growing into the nerve. So the nerve is this thing in the middle that looks like a whale with the mouth there. The mouth of the whale at that point is the blood vessel. And, um, and you see the parathyroid tissue growing directly into the perineurium around it. You can't, you can't really distinguish where the parathyroid tissue ends at the bottom of the, of the whale's mouth to where the, uh, where the nerve begins because it's growing into the nerve. So it's overt uh, intraneural invasion of the of the parathyroid tissue so this is this is a, a definitive of, of parathyroid carcinoma so i think that's that might be it actually right yeah so parathyroid carcinoma the the actual gland itself is two centimeters we see we see parathyroid glands that you know can be much larger than that so the size of the parathyroid itself is not particularly helpful in, in distinguishing adenoma carcinoma uh, but finding oh i did comment about vascular invasion okay good i did find this. so vascular invasion is present large nerve perineural invasion is present and, uh, and the lesion is, is focally present at the tissue edges. So then we actually did molecular testing on this uh, tumor and found that the patient had uh, a, a tuber sclerosis gene, a, a splice variant, even though it says spice variant, it's a splice variant. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it was spicy, but, uh, and then an EZH2 uh, mutation. Both of these findings actually uh, have been found, you know, we, we start thinking about, uh, you know, Hyperparathyroidism, jaw syndrome, HRPT2 gene mutations, but these two uh, these two genetic aberrations actually have both been found associated with parathyroid carcinoma. That, that I sent to Rogers read the papers associated with it. She's like, thank you for the light reading. <laughs> she just <laughs> wanted pictures. Wants this she light wanted pictures. reading. I'm yes. happy to I'm happy to give it to you. Um, really, really interesting. Um, thank you so much. Mind, I'm sorry. Do you mind for our endocrine fellows to? because it's not related to this case, but because of this presentation, can you talk about jaw tumor syndrome and HRPT every time I get that wrong? Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Because I know you, you know, we're well, not- The a HRPT2 gene makes a protein called menin. Uh, and this is the, this is typically what's seen in MEN1. Okay, that's the, the what's there. And so, so you can actually, uh, sorry, parafibromin which is gonna be, parafibromin protein is seen, uh, essentially can be seen in, in, um, in parathyroid carcinomas, it can be seen in atypical adenomas. We actually have an immunostain that several labs have to do this parafibromin staining. And what happens is when you see loss of parafibromin expression, which is mutated HRPT2, you can see this in parathyroid carcinoma, but you can also see it in atypical adenoma. So seeing retention of parafibromin typically indicates that it's, it's a benign lesion. So we don't worry. So you can actually see it retained in carcinomas, but if it's lost, it would actually support, support the diagnosis of carcinoma in that particular sense. It's a very, um, a very uh, persnickety uh, test to do. And, uh, and it, it has a lot of, it has a lot of false, false value. So it's not, it's not really done in many, many labs. We, we do it. Um, hyperparathyroidism jaw syndrome you can start getting changes in the jaw that you see uh, giant cell tumors present uh, in that form in the, in the jaw. And you actually have to know that the patient has hyperthyroidism associated with it because that type of finding can be found in several different uh, scenarios, including just giant cell tumors of the jaw, which can be spontaneous and can be associated with other findings that are there. So, so uh, looking for a brown tumor of hyperparathyroidism um, would be, can be associated with that uh, genetic finding as well. So we don't, you know, typically in those particular circumstances, we know that information ahead of time. So uh, when a patient comes, the patients don't particularly present with parathyroid carcinomas and, and then have us start looking at what's going on in the jaw. That typically, the jaw actually ends up being a precursor finding to looking for the parathyroid problem. So um, those patients can present with jaw pain from this benign but space-occupying lesion. And when should people send 
that test, obviously if they have a jaw tumor, that seems obvious, but um, should everyone who has a parathyroid carcinoma be tested for it? Yeah, I mean, the thing is the parathyroid, as you mentioned, you know, this is your first time seeing parathyroid carcinoma in your career. Um, and so parathyroid carcinomas are exceptionally rare. I actually personally feel as though they're overcalled. And I think one of the problems is that uh, pathologists are very fearful of lawsuits, okay? I mean, we are, we are very paranoid people. And so it's much easier to call something cancer than to call it benign and have it metastasize, right? Because to diagnose parathyroid carcinomas, traditionally, same way as you diagnose historically malignant pheochromocytomas, the diagnosis of malignancy is because of metastasis. Uh, and, and of course, now we know you can get multifocal paragangliomas, right? So, so we, we, we don't actually even include malignant pheochromocytoma in our WHO tumor book anymore. But um, so, so pathologists, you know, that require malignant met metastasis because these tumors are often quite bland, as, as you see from, you know, neuroendocrine tumors, the first tumor you talked about, they're histologically quite bland, but it's not particularly bland if it's metastatic to lymph nodes, right? So uh, even if, if by looking at the, the morphologic picture, so that's the, the case here is that the parathyroid tumors are particularly bland. So if we find uh, anything that might be suspicious of malignancy, there are a lot of pathologists that will just call it malignant. The reason why this is carries for first parathyroid carcinomas because you're we don't call like honey badgers. We don't call anything malignant when it comes to parathyroid, <laughs> right? So Rajri, I'm sure we, you have other so that was my next question and Rajri stopped me from talking because I can't help myself. But so what is the distinguishing <laughs> feature between a typical adenoma and a parathyroid carcinoma for our our fellows? Yeah. Great question. That was for Rajri. Oh I yeah. well from my understanding it's um, evidence of invasion and or metastatic disease because even um, atypical parathyroid adenoma um, can have histologic spe features that are also uh, suspicious for parathyroid carcinoma. Yeah, so the things that we look for is we look for tumor necrosis. We look for infiltration of the adjacent soft tissue. So actually direct invasion of the thyroid. You can get parathyroids, especially if there's been hemorrhage that are adherent to the thyroids. You can get fibrosis and find the parathyroid adherent to the thyroid. But if you actually see the parathyroid cells infiltrating from the parathyroid into the into the parenchyma of the thyroid would be a uh, suspicion for invasion or, or invasion of the surrounding tissues. The fiber adipose tissue surrounding the parathyroid would be enough for us, but then absolutely right, metastasis. Carrie, do you think you got, and do you did an on block resection with tumor present at the tissue edges or? Yeah, so I, I did the, um, you know, um, I, I, I no, there, there wasn't tissue present. I, I mean, I, I don't believe there was. Um, I got lucky. I mean, she she's wrong, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> and she has gross she has gross tumor resection, and sometimes the way that the way that it's you know removed or anything else can can sort of give what be like a, a false positive for the margin. Unless we sort of saw infiltration at the edges, then we wouldn't particularly worry about it. The same way as we start talking about margins of thyroid tissues, you know, we talk about a thyroid capsule, but the thyroid you know blends imperceptibly with the perithyroidal soft tissue. So. So there's really no, there's no capsule the same way this. So, so seeing some parathyroid tissue at the edge, if she feels that she has a gross tumor resection, then follow the parathyroid hormone levels. So the one thing I use, Sally, I, I, her, his PTH came down. So all of this is still, I still didn't know, sent the frozen section. We thought, you know, X, Y, and Z, but his PTH came down, right? Like I, a typical drop from 120 to 20 in 10 minutes. So I, you know, I, yeah, that's where I stopped. Uh, yeah, and and he's been fine. <laughs> Sorry, Rajri, you can finish. Oh, no, that's fine. This is great. Um, thank you. Thank you both. Um, so post-op, he um, underwent medialization of his right vocal fold, uh, followed by transcervical medialization, laryngoplasty um, with implant and right arytenopexy three months later. And then he um, has been referred for genetic testing, but as of today, when I looked it up, um, that workup is still pending. Um, so we will follow that. Um, I thought I would, a lot of this discussion has occurred, so I will be brief, but I just wanted to give an overview of uh, parathyroid carcinoma and then um, leave time for any um, other discussion or questions. So as Dr. Sadat was saying, um, this is uh, extremely rare, accounting for about 0.74% of primary hyperparathyroidism cases. Um, there's equal frequency of occurrence in both sexes, and it's usually diagnosed in the fifth decade of life. 
um, which is fitting given that I think our patient was 59. Um, it's typically um, sporadic, but can occur in the setting of familial primary hyperparathyroidism, as we discussed. Uh, mutations in the CDC 73 uh, gene are implicated in both familial and sporadic uh, parathyroid carcinoma. Um, and as Dr. Sadow touched on, um, CDC 73, um, 73 are, um, encodes parafibromin, a uh, tumor suppressor gene. So when there's a mutation, you can see loss of parafibromin on the immunohistochemistry. Um, inactivating germline mutations in this gene are also responsible for autosomal dominant type of familial hyperparathyroidism, um, such as jaw tumor syndrome, like we talked about, um, where you can see these ossifying fibromas of the jaw, renal lesions, uterine tumors, um, and increased risk of parathyroid uh, cancer uh, in up to about 15% of these patients. And then other genetic alterations have also um, been studied. Uh, in terms of clinical features, um, most parathyroid carcinomas are functioning and typically present with signs and symptoms of hypercalcemia. Um, it's not uncommon to see calcium levels above 13 and PTH levels uh, two to 10 times the upper limit of normal. Um, accordingly, patients can present in parathyroid crisis with associated renal failure, cardiac arrhythmias, and altered mental status. And then other presenting clinical features include a palpable mass or nerve palsy and evidence of nodal um, and or distant METs. And then finally, patients can of course present without symptoms if the carcinoma is non-functioning, um, but in these instances, uh, morbidity is usually driven by the tumor burden rather than hypercalcemia. Here's just a quick photo of a different patient I took care of last year um, who presented with bilateral femur fractures after falling off of this chair. And he was found to have metastatic parathyroid cancer with PTH um, above 5,000. And then here is a patient who was actually transferred to the Brigham this fall uh, from an outside hospital. Um, this was her preoperative scan showing a large right parathyroid mass. Uh, when the surgeons um, at that hospital went uh, to resect it, they noted that it was here uh, to many nearby structures, including the thyroid and esophagus. And unfortunately, um, she had an esophageal injury that was recognized days later and then was transferred to us. And here you can see, um, this is where the mass uh, resection um, attempt was taking place. And this is the NG2 and then the disruption of the esophagus and um, significant subcutaneous air. Um, so as you can imagine, benign and malignant primary hyperparathyroidism often overlap in presentation. Um, since they're both driven uh, by hypercalcemia. The most important thing I think to remember is that the odds are still that the disease is benign. Um, for example, just 5% of uh, hypercalcemic crises are caused by carcinoma, and almost 90% are caused by adenoma with the remainder um, by multi-gland hyperplasia or other pathology. Items that might increase your suspicion for carcinoma include a markedly elevated PTH and calcium, as we talked about, a neck mass, and then male gender, um, because even though there's equal uh, predilection for men and women, um, benign disease favors women three to one. And then mostly the diagnosis um, can't be made preoperatively, um, and it can even be difficult to tell intraoperatively. That said, there are some clues sometimes on ultrasound that could increase suspicion for carcinoma. Um, so these include um, you know, large size, uh, irregular shape, non-circumscribed margin, intranodular calcifications, heterogeneity, and then evidence of local invasion. This is in contrast to the more typical uh, findings we'll see for um, an adenoma. Another tool that can potentially distinguish um, cancer versus adenoma is a Sestamibi scan, as some studies have shown that parathyroid cancers may have higher retention level compared to parathyroid adenomas. Um, but this has large, so here's an example for the increased retention for the parathyroid cancer versus adenoma. Um, but these studies have mainly been done retrospectively, so it's hard to know how clinically uh, useful they'd be um, if used preoperatively. And then um, I won't go um, into more of the path, but basically, as we discussed, the diagnosis of parathyroid carcinoma is established by the presence of invasion. And um, you can often see this, that loss of um, parafibroma. Um, other nonspecific um, features um, we also um, discussed, but are important to look out for, but can also be common to atypical parathyroid adenoma. 
Um, two TMN staging systems have been proposed, but given the low incidence, um, neither of them is used widely. And I think Dr. Stata, you were saying we don't use uh, either of them at MGH. Correct. And then um, in terms of treatment, um, when cancer is suspected preoperatively, initial surgery can include um, end block resection of the tumor, ipsilateral thyroid lobe, as well as any involved adjacent structures with the goal of achieving uh, gross negative margins. Involved lymph nodes should be removed, but there's no consensus at this point as to the role of prophylactic lymph node dissection. Um, in fact, the par parathyroidectomy guidelines have a recommendation against them since there's no um, predilection for lymph node metastasis. But I'm interrupting you more to say that you're missing a bullet on this slide about intraoperative suspicion by the surgeon. So as endocrine surgeons, we often tumble in my career tumble yeah. to it by its appearance. So yeah. it's intraoperative suspicion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and White rock hard stuck to everything around it and gritty. Uh, I should have taken the lobe. There's <laughs> I, I hear you. No, it was well, just... you don't have to take the lobe if it's not stuck to the lobe, but you have to take all the gradu and schmutz no, that's I, around it. No, it's funny. I'm listening to this. And if I were listening to the story, I would say it was just the whole kit and caboodle that day and I hadn't consented him. The one thing I would say to all the fellows is it's horrifying to consent your patients for everything horrifying that could potentially happen, but consenting them for unexpected findings is an important thing. And just when, especially with doing thyroid lobectomy for um, now that we're potentially yeah. recommending it for large tumors saying, I need you to know that if I find a positive lymph node, I'm going to take your other lobe out. Like those are important conversations to have with your patients before the surgery. And yeah. I was totally unprepared for this. And it, with everything going on, the pandemic, and I, it, everything, I was, it was just, um, it, it, it turned into a, a situation that I, I normally am very prepared, prepared for, and I, I wasn't. And, I, now, if I could, you know, retrospectively do it, I would take, I would have taken his low, as you know, this his thyroid lobe out. Yeah. Carrie, I, I was going to commend you because you had, you know, in a situation where it didn't look like any, like preoperative evidence, like you were saying, you know, you were the surgeon that performed ultrasounds, you know, at two different time points and had a, a suspicion based on that second ultrasound that you performed. Exactly. So I should have taken his lobe out. <laughs> That's exact. I, I, I can feel Sally in my head right now. If I had a suspicion and I, I second guessed myself and I thought, well, maybe this is a posterior tubercle nodule that I thought was a parathyroid. And so oh, in my I mind, when I went in, I thought I was, I was missing that he had four gland hyperplasia and I was going to do a four gland expiration. So in my mind, I thought I, I wasn't, I really wasn't, there was just no thought in my mind that this was a parathyroid carcinoma. Along those lines, I reviewed a paper about five years ago from a different setting on a different disease. The thrust of the paper was the ultrasound findings changed and they didn't notice it. And therefore I didn't have to take out this five centimeter mass that wasn't there on the first ultrasound. No, you, you needed to react to the five centimeter mass that you found during surgery. This is not you, Carrie, the, you, know, you know, difficult days happen. Very nice presentation. Um, great, thank you. Um, just one or two more things, um, just to keep in mind. Um, we know we've we've studied this over and over again, but of course, if someone presents with critical hypercalcemia, the priority is preoperative medical optimization uh, to lower calcium levels and prevent any metabolic uh, disturbances, especially before surgery. Um, so, guiding principles: you know, start with hydration. Loop diuretics should not be used until the patient is adequately hydrated. Uh, calcitonin and normal saline act pretty immediately, whereas bisphosphonates take at least 48 hours for effect. And then HD can always be considered in cases of profound hypercalcemia um, or when you have a patient in cardiac or renal failure who's not responding to other um, management. Uh, in, um, in most series, administration of radiation is not associated with better local regional control or overall survival. And unfortunately, there's no standardized protocols for chemotherapy, um, although there have been some partial um, responses uh, in a few case series. Serafinib, um, which is a protein kinase inhibitor used in 
renal cell carcinoma, HCC, and thyroid cancer um, has been shown to have some efficacy um, in some cases of parathyroid cancer. Um, and like other malignancies, uh, there's ongoing research uh, to identify targetable mutations. And then lastly, in terms of prognosis, hypercalcemia is really the primary driver of morbidity and mortality. Recurrences are frequent, but long-term survival is pretty favorable. And as of right now, there's no association with nodal involvement in overall survival. Um, so in terms of protective features, unsurprisingly, lack of distant meds um, and clear margins are associated with increased survival. So thank you very much. Um, I'll leave it um, now to the group to see if anybody has any other final thoughts or questions. And the patient's doing great. Yes, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> Still learn from your mistakes. Surprises happen. There's no mistake Talk here. Kate. I, I think you're I mean, being way yeah. too hard on yourself. Yeah, so. I agree with when. <laughs> anyway. He did great okay. Job. I got lucky. And great job. And then the, the, the one that, that, that image, like I agree with Sally was like really, really cool. Um, so interop, did you decide to take out notes? You just said, Hey, or did something, did something? Well, I happen normal? to know because Peter Sato is my, um, attending and I've actually read a lot about this before I saw it that I knew, I knew that nodes, uh, I, I never bought that, that lymph node dissection helped with parathyroid carcinoma. I never bought that. So, I mean, he didn't have any either. I mean, you know, you're in there, you're feeling around. It was already sketchy. So I was, you know, looking around, but I didn't see anything obvious. And, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I looked around cause I had already taken his nerves. So why not? You can, <laughs> there wasn't anything else to bag, but no, I didn't see anything. And, and I'll tell you how Quandu and Orlo Clark taught me is that with parathyroid cancer, you're either going to end up taking the nerve or it's going to take the nerve either that first time or one of the subsequent times. Yeah. And so, um, it, it, you know, I don't think you had any real choice here. Um, yeah. but even if you had say spared the nerve this time, the likelihood is local. I mean, I tried, don't get me wrong. I yeah, mean, yeah, have exactly. you seen a case where the PTHs were totally normal like that? Yeah. Oh, definitely. I was yeah. going to say that this can be a great mimicker and you just have to be prepared for every parathyroid, yeah. case, right? So for the fellows, you go in there, it's like, oh, easy street. This is going to be and easy. I was like, to I'm going to, I'm going to push it. I'm going to dissect it off. And I was like, finally, I'm like, dude, this is not happening. So yeah. you're, you're for every parathyroid case, you have to be ready. And yeah. yes, I mean, I, I agree with Peter that I believe this is probably overcalled um, overall, uh, or at least people slap the atypical um, label on it. But I think everyone should be ready uh, intraoperatively anytime. I mean, I would say, you know, yes, the vast majority of parathyroid cases are awesome and quick and all the rest of it. But, you know, you, you do enough of these, you will run into this. And, you know, you just have to have the intraoperative judgment to say, it, it's not coming off easily. I got to, I got to, you know, um, I got to do some more. And it's the same thing for like, let's say a lap adrenal, right? When you're doing lap adrenal and you like, it's like really sticky and it's like, you know, you can't get it off other stuff. You have to have a low um, threshold to convert. And so it's all these things. Surgeon judgment trumps a lot of things and you have to be really, really kind of prepared for all eventualities. And I called, I called Apple, who I always call Apple Stevens. And she was downtown. She's like, what is going on? I'm like, I'm in Danvers and I'm taking a nerve. She's like, okay, tell me the situation. Like, it's okay in the middle of the case, call one of your colleagues, people you trust and just be like, I'm going to do something crazy here. It doesn't seem right. And then just to whatever it is, um, it's, it's good to have someone just to say like, all right, that sounds reasonable. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get hate mail. That's all of us. Fellows, call, your, call your former attendings. From yeah, Texas. it happens all uh, the time. And, I and, hope and, you guys can call cool. us anytime. Just be and like, so, hey. Most of the time, I was just saying this to Sarah today, most of the time, you know what to do, right? But it's yeah, having that, that little bit of yeah. confirmation, yeah. that support. And you can even say, you know, I talked to my fellowship director, or I talked to my, you know, experienced colleague and, 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 you know, they support this, uh, this decision. Right. To talk to the patient. That's a great the, point. When, when you're talking to the patient's family or the patient afterwards and you say, you know, I was really stressed about this, but I wanted to make sure I was doing the right thing. I just made a quick call to, you know, someone else who, who trained me, blah, blah, blah. And yeah, and it doesn't put them at risk or anything like that. But uh, that, I absolutely, I think that's a really important point. Yeah. Or I called my colleague in to take a look. I do that all the time. And I still do that. I'm 12 years out. I still do that all the time. It's not, it's right, Rashri? Yeah, I mean, Apple and I, she calls me in now, which is so flattering. She's like, I'm just making sure, you know, I'm doing this right. So no, it's, it's don't, don't be ashamed if it's something that's out of the ordinary. 
Right, Sally? That's right. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, excellent. Excellent presentation. I just wanted to thank, thank Peter because he's the pathologist and he doesn't normally yes, work. Thank you. Time. It was I'm very just kidding, helpful. Peter. <laughs> yes, thank and you. Great images. He's fantastic. And um, yeah, I'm sure you read a lot of his papers. Thank you, Rashri. That was fantastic. All right, we can go ahead and move on to the last presentation. Adi, if you want to get your presentation going. All right, can you guys hear me? We can. Okay, great. So um, today I will be presenting um, a topic about cortisol uh, sparing adrenalectomy um, in MEN2 uh, patients. Sorry, just having a little technical difficulties now. Um, okay. So um, we have a 21-year-old female uh, with a germline RET M918T mutation, um, which is just of MEN2B, who underwent a total thyroidectomy for a multifocal MTC at another hospital, um, who presented to us um, with a left lateral neck adenopathy and a right adrenal mass. Uh, she had no past medical history, and aside from the total thyroidectomy in uh, 2006, uh, she had a tonsillectomy. Um, at the, uh, at, in 1992. She had no known family history of endocrinopathies. And when she presented to us, um, she just presented with um, a palpable left level 2A lymph node and mucosal neuromas of the tongue and the lip margin. But um, she was really asymptomatic at the time with not complaining of any headaches, tremors, um, or palpitations. In terms of her lab, she had elevation of her calcitonin and CEA. Um, and then uh, we obtained plasma metanephrines, and she had elevation of her plasma metanephrines, norometanephrines, and total metanephrines. And her CT of the neck showed recurrent central compartment disease and at least one node in the left lateral neck compartment. So we obtained a CT abdomen pelvis, um, and that identified a 2.5 by 1.5 centimeter lobulated mass in the body of the right adrenal gland. So in 2007, she underwent a right retroperitoneoscopic total adrenalectomy with an adrenal cortex autographed. Um, and I'll go over a little bit later, but um, these now, as, as far as we know, don't really um, have the best function afterwards. Um, her pathology showed a two centimeter pheochromocytoma with negative margins. So then in May of 2007, she underwent a bilateral central neck dissection a bilateral modified radical neck dissection and um, a firm metastatic MTC. And uh, then in 2009, um, she started developing lightheadedness, headache, and labile blood pressure. Um, we got labs on her again and showed um, elevation in her metanephrines, nor metanephrines, and total metanephrines. And we um, got a Another CT, uh, which showed a four by three centimeter mass arising from the lateral limb um, in the left adrenal and another 1.4 centimeter mass arising from the medial limb of the left adrenal. So you can see here is the large uh, mass from the lateral limb and then here is the smaller mass from the medial limb. So in 2009, she underwent an open um, cortical sparing left adrenalectomy. Uh, where uh, we saw the large medial limb mass uh, with the smaller left lateral uh, limb mass that, was both, that were both resected. And we left um, about a two, centi two centimeter um, amount of left medial limb cortex and two by three centimeter left lateral limb cortex. And her path showed a five centimeter left medial limb pheo and a 0.8 centimeter left lateral uh, limb pheochromocytoma. Postoperatively, unfortunately, um, she uh, was found with um, um, with uh, adrenal insufficiency, um, despite the cortical sparing um, approach. Um, and uh, she was started on steroid replacement therapy. Um, and by the way, during that operation, um, at least for the operative report, uh, the adrenal vein was unable to be spared. So 
uh, she required glucocorticoid and mineralocorticoid replacement permanently uh, with about one to two episodes of adrenal crises per year uh, between 2009 um, and 2015. Um, and during MTC surveillance, she had an MR of the abdomen in 2013 that showed a recurrence um, of the uh, FIO um, at about 1.1 centimeters, but she was just pretty asymptomatic at the time. Uh, but then in 2015, she became symptomatic again with tremors, weakness, uh, hot flashes, diaphoresis, and her metanephrines were mildly elevated, but elevated. And we got a repeat CT, um, which showed that um, the mass had grown to about 2.9 centimeters, but this time was um, between the left renal artery and the vein and abutting the pancreatic tail. Um, and it was, uh, uh, had some central necrosis. Uh, so in 2015, she underwent a left retroperitoneoscopic renal hilar mass resection that was consistent with a four centimeter FIO. And postoperatively, she did well, but again, continued her steroid replacement for adrenal insufficiency. Um, and then between uh, 2015 and, and 2020, um, she again on MTC surveillance was found with um, recurrence um, in about 2019. Um, but uh, was asymptomatic. Uh, but then in 2020, she started noticing more symptoms of tremors, diaphoresis, blood pressure lability. But more importantly, at this time, she wanted to start a family and she um, went seeking fertility counseling. Um, and given the symptoms and given the presence of a known um, uh, pheochromocytoma recurrence, uh, the decision was made to pursue resection. Um, we obtained a CT at this time and it showed a 3.5 centimeter soft tissue mass anterior to the left renal hilum, but encasing the left renal artery this time, um, which had increased in size from 1.9 centimeters from 2019. Uh, we obtained a CTA, um, which we uh, frequently do in a reoperative setting just to get a sense of um, the uh, renal vasculature or, or any vasculature around the mass um, to get a better sense of uh, encasement, which is really important in this situation because we found that it was encasing the renal artery and we had to discuss with her about um, uh, sacrificing her kidney uh, during resection. Um, so we were at a position right now where we were you know, thinking this is recurrent, recurrent. Um, she likely will need a nephrectomy, but then we either decide on performing this and doing a nephrectomy or having her go into a pregnancy with adrenal insufficiency and uh, pheochromocytoma. Um, Hang on, so, uh -huh. can I ask a question? Sure. She had a high ACTH, so it's a topic ACTH. And do you know that that's from the pheo or from medullary? Did I get this wrong? The, I'm sorry, the, um, which the, um, this, this recurrence? I know that she has recurrent FIO, yeah. but uh -huh. she also had ectopic ACTH. And do you know if that's from FIO or from medullary? Um, I don't know. What's the liver look like? The, so the, in the liver, actually, so the liver she did have, she had one uh, liver metastasis that was consistent with uh, MTC. Yeah, I think the thought was that the high ACTH was from her cork, um, adrenal cortical insufficiency, but... Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't think there was ever a corresponding high cortisol level with that. Okay, sorry, thanks. Okay. So um, in uh, 2020, uh, August 2020, we proceeded with the left unblock theochromocytoma resection with a nephrectomy. Um, and the path at that time showed a five centimeter pheo, uh, which was surrounding the renal hilar vasculature. So um, some things that I wanted to talk about with this case um, are the use of different operative techniques for cortisol, cortical sparing adrenalectomy, uh, balancing the risk of recurrent pheochromocytoma with the development of adrenal insufficiency. And um, in this case, specifically talking about peripartum morbidity of recurrent pheos versus um, adrenal insufficiency. So who should we consider for cortisol, cortical sparing adrenalectomy? Um, Usually we think about um, patients with bilateral pheochromocytoma or patients at risk for bilateral uh, recurrent pheochromocytoma, which includes patients with MEN2, VHL, and F1. And those patients have a frequency of bilateral pheos in about 63% of patients with MEN2 
um, and 43% of patients with DHL, but um, a very low uh, malignancy rate, less than 5%. So we perform cortical sparing adrenalectomies based on the following assumptions that there's very low risk of malignancy, there's a reasonable risk of recurrence that can be easily followed and treated, and then that there's a high chance of maintaining normal adrenal cortical function. So the operative strategies that um, we employ um, are open adrenalectomy, laparoscopic transabdominal adrenalectomy, and posterior retroperitoneoscopic adrenalectomy. And some of the operative, um, I'm sorry, and then um, what becomes important is that um, the kind of, in terms of the ability to do cortical sparing surgery, um, it's important to see that um, sometimes they can be pedunculated versus embedded within the, within the cortex. So um, the ability to take, take the um, pheochromocytoma from the, um, from the cortex can be significantly easier in the sense, in the situation where it's pedunculated versus where you'd have to um, really kind of carve it out of the cortex, which is likely to lead to more fracturing and more risk of recurrence. And then some of the strategies to think about that have been um, highlighted in this case are the adrenal cortex, the use of an adrenal cortex autograft, which was done um, in the late 90s and early 2000s, but also how much cortex do we leave? Should we uh, preserve the adrenal vein or not? And so in terms of the autograft function, um, uh, the Sinai group in 2000 looked at um, heterotopic autotransplantation um, in um, hereditary pheochromocytomas where they did total um, adrenalectomies. Um, in about 14 patients, and they autotransplanted in the rectus and then subsequently gave ACTH to stimulate um, a function of the um, um, autotransplanted adrenal. And they found that 30% led to, 30% actually had autograft function. Um, previous to that in the 90s, this was mostly done in the setting of um, Cushing's disease, but they had pretty discouraging results um, from um, adrenal autotransplantation. But um, in our situation, uh, the patient did not, um, she had uh, the um, contralateral adrenal, so she really never had any issues with um, adrenal insufficiency after her first operation. Uh, but when we saw adrenal insufficiency after her, um, after her second operation, we knew that that autograft wasn't really working. Um, in terms of uh, how much um, adrenal remnant to leave, um, we usually, studies have shown that about 15 to 30% of well vascularized adrenal tissue is necessary, but these studies are really very small. Um, one study was done looking at about 10 patients um, who, um, where they left about between 15 to 30%, and they saw that all of them actually had perioperative adrenal insufficiency, but uh, by one year, all of them actually ended up having um, normal ACTH levels um, and uh, were not steroid dependent. And then in terms of adrenal vein preservation, um, Dr. Grubbs um, at, at, um, at MD Anderson, um, we, produce, we uh, did a, a study of about um, 96 patients and uh, 78 of which who ha uh, had MEN2. And uh, we looked at adrenal preservation um, as part of that study. And we found that, that there was no difference in steroid dependence in those um, with and without adrenal preservation. Um, so this is just to kind of recap that study where um, we took that 96 patients over a 50 year time period, 78 of which had MEN2, uh, that included 154 adrenalectomies, um, 130 which were open, uh, six which were uh, laparoscopic transabdominal and 18 which were uh, posterior retroperitoneoscopic, um, which is the um, um, uh, technique the, that we uh, most frequently employ now. Um, three, there was a 3% recurrence rate for open adrenalectomies and a 12.5% recurrence rate for LAP or PRA. Again, that was back in 2011. Um, and since then, um, you know, I think that with the learning curve, it's, um, our recurrence rate has decreased. Uh, but that was actually not statistically significant. Um, and then looking at um, the recurrence between total adrenalectomy and cortical sparing adrenalectomy, there was no uh, statistically significant difference. And then some other adjuncts that can be used in the operating room um, are intraoperative ultrasound, where we can use that to kind of see where the cortex is in, in, in relation to the pheo um, to aid in cortical sparing. Um, in addition to that, um, ICG, uh, which um, will um, 
uh, highlight the adrenal cortex, uh, which um, the, from the Cleveland Clinic group, they published a study in 2018 that um, where they did cortical sparing adrenalectomies um, and uh, found a good success rate with uh, ICG use. And like we did in this case, um, we frequently use um, preoperative CTA with uh, 3D reconstruction to assist with surgical planning, especially um, um, in this situation. So um, when we're thinking about, uh, thinking about resection um, and cortical sparing surgery in patients with uh, MEN2A or MEN2, we have to think about the fact that we're essentially treating one disease for another. Resection of their adrenal neoplasia for adrenal insufficiency or the risk of adrenal insufficiency. So it's a constant balance between um, um, recurrence and adrenal insufficiency, recurrence and cortical sparing adrenalectomy and, adre um, and adrenal insufficiency and total adrenalectomy. Um, so what, what are the symptoms of adrenal insufficiency? Why do we get so concerned about this? And so adrenal insufficiency um, is characterized by the inability of the adrenal cortex or really lack thereof in, in the surgical setting to produce sufficient amount of um, uh, steroids. So and symptoms of adrenal insufficiency are pretty nonspecific and include fatigue, weight loss, orthostatic hypotension, and anorexia. Um, and as you can tell with this kind of constellation of symptoms, it gets frequently misdiagnosed and underdiagnosed in the uh, community. Um, and then situations with adrenal crisis um, include uh, severe weakness, syncope, abdominal pain, uh, back pain, and confusion, um, which um, can be quite disastrous and prom promoted by um, surgery, um, uh, trauma, um, and other physiologic insults like um, um, Ill um, infection. So um, in terms of um, looking at recurrence rates, so cortical sparing adrenalectomy um, the, the previously the, the thought was, or the concern with them was that there would be a high risk of recurrence because you're, you, you are um, leaving the cortex behind, uh, but at the, risk of, um, at the risk of seeding the adrenal bed with medullary tissue. Um, whereas with total adrenalectomy, um, you're completely removing all the adrenal tissue. There's no, you know, no real risk of fracturing the medulla and, um, and seeding the adrenal bed. So these patients, um, the thought is that they'd have decreased risk of recurrence and decreased rate of reoperation. However, with cortical sparing adrenalectomy, we're looking at the low likelihood of needing steroid replacement um, versus the high likelihood, essentially 100% need for steroid replacement and total adrenalectomy in addition to the sequelae of adrenal insufficiency, uh, which we're balancing. So um, in uh, 2014, um, a group looked at uh, adrenalectomy um, in uh, MEN2 patients specifically. Um, and they looked at, uh, this was an international consortium uh, looking at uh, 552 MEN2 patients who underwent adrenalectomy. 114 underwent cortical sparing versus 375 uh, who underwent a total adrenalectomy. And they actually found a very low recurrence rate of 5% among the cortical sparing. But interestingly, 43% uh, actually ended up being steroid dependent after cortical sparing adrenalectomy versus 100%. So pretty high um, um, amount of uh, cortical devascularization. And then uh, in 2019, um, another um, international uh, consortium of bilateral um, adrenalectomy um, looked at uh, adrenalectomies, uh, bilateral adrenalectomy or bilateral disease in patients with MEN2, uh, and VHL, um, and uh, they actually found that patients with MEN2 uh, were less likely to be successful um, after bilateral adrenalectomy and were more likely to actually undergo total adrenalectomy. Uh, but um, in looking at the recurrence rate um, of patients who underwent cort cortical sparing adrenalectomy, there was a lower recurrence rate. Um, there, were, there was a recurrence rate of around 13% versus 0.6% of the total adrenalectomy. Um, in terms of adrenal insufficiency, 100% uh, adrenal insufficiency in the total adrenalectomy group, but 23.5% adrenal insufficiency in the cortical sparing group. Now, looking at the patients who had um, adrenal insufficiency, this this study actually broke down into how what the symptoms were, or how many how many of these uh, patients had crisis. So, 18% um, of the patients um, who under who developed uh, steroid dependence. Uh, had one adrenal crisis and 6% actually had two adrenal crises. And another thing to consider is that uh, sometimes these patients actually become cushionoid. 
with um, symptom over, um, steroid over replacement. So actually about 13% of those patients who were steroid dependent actually became Cushingoid. So again, in going back to our uh, balance between uh, cortical sparing adrenalectomy and total adrenalectomy, we find that actually the recurrence rate um, in cortical sparing adrenalectomy now is lower um, between five and 13%. Uh, but this low likelihood of uh, steroid replacement, it's not so low. Um, it, between 23 to 43%. So that's important in educating um, our patients who, you know, continuing to need a reoperative surgery is that, you know, there still is not a very um, uh, low risk of um, cortical devascularization, given the fact that around 20% are going to need steroids uh, postoperatively. Uh, but you balance that with the uh, total adrenalectomy group where 100% are going to need steroid replacement. And you have about 18, 13% who have sequelae of adrenal insufficiency or steroid over replacement. And you balance that with the decreased risk of recurrence at 0.5%. So uh, the last thing uh, for, um, that was important, especially for this patient, is the fact that um, you know, she was looking for, um, the reason why she wanted surgery was really uh, because she wanted to, uh, because if she had preconception counseling um, and she wanted to um, decrease her um, catecholamine surges uh, during pregnancy. Um, and so she, it was recommended that she undergo pheochromocytoma resection before um, in vitro fertilization. So um, just in looking at the peripartum morbidity of recurrence versus adrenal insufficiency, um, if left untreated, maternal and fetal mortality in patients with pheochromocytoma approach about 50%. But with antenatal diagnosis and treatment, maternal mortality decreases to less than 5% with fetal mortality at around 15%. So in a systemic review around 75, uh, 77 pregnancies, 10 of whom um, had MEN2, uh, the mor maternal mortality rate was 8%. But um, with antenatal diagnosis, which would happen in patients with MEN2, uh, there was a 12% fetal mortality rate, a 0% maternal mortality rate, and an 86% successful outcome of pregnancy. Um, and if resection was going to be undertaken, it was recommended that it happened during the second trimester or medical management until delivery followed by resection. And in terms of adrenal insufficiency in pregnancy, um, adrenal insufficiency is associated with impaired fertility due to chronic inovulation if untreated or unrecognized. Uh, but interestingly, adrenal crisis occurred in approximately 70% of pregnant women during uh, who had um, adrenal insufficiency. Um, so those symptoms of adrenal crisis during pregnancy um, um, need to be consi uh, strongly considered, um, and uh, these patients need extensive counseling about um, the symptoms of adrenal uh, crisis and adrenal insufficiency. Um, recent literature showing no uh, report of maternal death with, um, with adrenal insufficiency, but women with adrenal insufficiency were more likely to have pregnancies with intrauterine growth retardation, um, transverse lies, and postpartum hemorrhage. So just to summarize, um, MEN2 patients have a high likelihood of requiring bilateral adrenalectomy with a low malignancy rate. These patients are good candidates for cortisol sparing adrenalectomy and bilateral cortisol adrenal, um, adrenalectomy in the setting of uh, bilateral disease. Patients will likely undergo multiple operations during their lifetime using several different modalities that was seen um, in this uh, scenario. And studies have shown that cortisol sparing adrenalectomy can be performed with a low risk of recurrence, but with moderate risk of postoperative steroid dependence. And then finally, ME and two patients benefit from preconception fertility counseling to discuss pregnancy with adrenal insufficiency versus recurrent pheochromocytoma. Thank you. So you raise huge amount. I mean, I figured I hung around. I might as well interrupt your entire group. <laughs> so you bring up a lot of imp important points. The first thing, the first slide you started off with it was a 21 year old with metastatic medullary carcinoma who presented with these symptoms. But you didn't start off with if she inherited this disease from her parents. Was she known congenital um, occurrence of this disease? And if so, she should have had her thyroidectomy when? Oh, uh, she should have had her thyroidectomy at the age of well, six months, six months to a year. Right, yeah. right. So, so it should have been a long, long time ago. And then yeah. you spent a lot of time discussing her pregnancy that she wants, but she has a she has a fifty percent chance of providing this to her offspring. So the whole focus should have been on counseling. She shouldn't be having children, especially given the fact she has metastatic cancer and all sorts of other comorbidities. So that that whole discussion about whether or not she should actually be attempting a pregnancy, given her history, 
is another thing, but that's a, this is a major discussion that you didn't bring up. I mean, I think it's huge, even though it may be focally inappropriate. The other thing is this multifocal disease that she's had with her pheochromocytoma. Now, um, you know, in a patient like this, there's only one adrenal medulla. So you you mentioned kind of multiple tumors. She had a she had a tumor in this limb. She had a tumor in that limb. There's only one medulla. There's no three limbs of the medulla. There's only one medulla. So, it, and, and, and since this is, a, this is a, an expressed RET mutation that's systemic, taking out, a, a, taking out a, a dominant mass that you can see grossly is not removing, she needs to have the entire medulla removed. It's, it's not multiple tumors, it's, 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 it's differential growth of that, of that adrenal medulla. So, so you're not removing the, the, the lesion unless you actually take out the entire adrenal medulla, which, which sort of argues toward, even though the, the data you showed showed some, some uh, positive benefit of, of adrenal cortex sparing surgery, really the patient needed an adrenalectomy, but then the patient had bilateral disease, which is an issue, um, especially given we talked about her metastatic medullary thyroid carcinoma. So then the other thing you need to be bringing in to the conversation given the METs uh, and some concomitant diseases, uh, is she taking any medications because there's, there are great drugs now for her, her RET positive metastatic medullary thyroid carcinoma. So what's her current you know, serum calcitonin levels, given all this other stuff that she's got going on, and is all of her disease under control as she's discussing the possibility of breeding. <laughs> so, I, I mean, this whole case is like a disaster. And it's and so you could, you, you talked about in terms of the adrenal cortical sparing surgery, but there's like 35,000 angles you can go from this case. That would be very <laughs> interesting, right? Yeah, okay, no, the, you can talk, you can, there's so much you can talk about these patients with ME and 2B. Um, regarding her um, metastatic MTC, I mean, there's a lot to un unload here, but um, she had fairly stable disease. I didn't go over the specific numbers, but her disease was stable just with one lesion in the, in the liver pretty much over the last five to, five to six years after the diagnosis um, with pretty much stability of her calcitonin and her CEA. So in that situation, uh, we, don't, um, we don't start RET inhibitor therapy given the fact that she had stability of her, of her um, metastatic medullary thyroid cancer. Um, you know, looking back, I mean, this case happened, uh, this, she presented here uh, back in, 2000, in 2007. Um, you know, I did a pretty extensive chart review. I couldn't find anything about her parents, um, which was interesting. Um, when, I, when I operated on her in 2020, I didn't, uh, I didn't ask her specifically about that because you know, with COVID, I mean, I didn't even, her parents weren't even allowed in weren't even allowed into the hospital. So I didn't want to really open that up, but uh, that's a really good point. I mean, she should have had, she should have had her surgery um, during infancy, but clearly she didn't know that her parents had any symptoms. So in all likelihood, her parents were not diagnosed. Can, can I interrupt at this, at that of course. point? I, uh, I disagree with the question uh, who, who stated that she should not be having children. That's entirely her decision. That's not my decision, her surgeon or anybody else's, that's her decision. But I also agree with the query because it was a little disconcerting to hear that she's ready to start a family in a kind of an offhand, of course, everybody with Hashimoto's thyroiditis was ready. It didn't sound like it had been given due consideration. It's a really big deal for her to start a family. So it's a mixed bag there. Yeah, I mean, from my from my perspective, there, I was being facetious in the sense that, but but the discussion, the fact that the discussion of her of her of the consequences and and potential wasn't discussed. So it was more of, about the discussing that she, she can do whatever she wants, her body, her choice. I'm not 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 type of type of thing, but but just sort of what what are the ramifications? Has she considered all of these things? And and then she makes her educated decision. But the other part of it too, in terms of her parents, if her parents are both well with no evidence of disease, then she very well, well may have had a spontaneous, you know, um, M9, M918T mutation, the most common, it's the most common spontaneous one, but she's definitely gonna pass it on 50% uh, of, of the time. So even if her parents weren't involved, but that's, that's sort of part of the discussion uh, about how you go about monitoring these patients too for their different manifestations and how she needs to, to kind of subsequently track. Um, I'll make a few comments here. If anyone else has any other questions, uh, while you formulate them. Um, 
I, I think Audie did a good job in uh, kind of picking up a topic that he wanted to to um, go through. This is not my patient, and it, but it's a patient that spanned Anderson for for multiple decades, um, and who has spanned multiple attendings as well, which and uh, does have kind of important uh, and interesting points to one of the facts being that yeah in MEN2 um, that you have a low likelihood of a, a met or um, a metastatic pheochromocytoma or malignant lesion um, and so that um, in this disease process and you are thinking that you know a, a cortex preserving surgery is important for the patient for for their um, for their um, the decrease in morbidity of being adrenal insufficient and in not all cases of, of uh, PO presentation will allow for the cortex presentations or preservation. So, like Audie showed, you know, some um, some tumors are pedunculated and and uh, are easy to spare uh, normal parts of the adrenal, and some are not, uh, and there's no uh, preservation of, of tissue. Um, and uh, to Dr. Sadal's point, yeah, you, know, you were leaving behind medullary tissue, and that does, you know, have a higher risk of recurrence uh, in the future, especially in a germline uh, person. So, um, but we're kind of uh, buying time of kind of decreasing one uh, core morbidity of adrenal insufficiency, which is uh, not in inconsequential. And so um, this is kind of important to, to consider, especially in the cases where you see metachronous tumors, where, you know, in one side, there may be a normal adrenal gland, but in the future, that may develop a, a pheochromocytoma, and you don't know the presentation of it and whether cortex will be able to be spared on that side in the future or not. So I would say, you know, the, you should always kind of plan to uh, uh, um, especially scrutinize the glands to see if there's uh, any ability to preserve tissue. But, um, you know, in the end, probably not at the expense of, uh, of uh, fracturing a tumor or disseminating a potential pheochromocytoma throughout the abdomen. Um, and then again, uh, kind of as towards the end of the case, you know, there comes a point where uh, there's no, you know, further viable tissue or no, you know, ability to preserve uh, any cortex, and um, you have to kind of make a judgment call, I guess, per person and per um, case uh, on their presentation. Before, you know, it may progress something where it's a little bit more doing harm to the patient than doing good for them. I just want to re reiterate um, sort of some of those points. I mean, doing a, a true cortical sparing adrenalectomy is just technically challenging. I think truly what we're really doing are just partial adrenalectomies. And really, um, I think there's always going to be a little bit of a risk of recurrence uh, that's higher, of course, than if you do a true um, total adrenalectomy. Um, but I think it's uh, you just have to be honest with the patient. You just just have to say, you know, there's a risk of recurrence and there's a high likelihood. And I think as long as the patients understand that you're leaving um, some tissue at risk, and that's an important part of the preoperative counseling. Um, we've actually been doing some 3D reconstruction, and so not just sort of 3D CT scans, but making models of the adrenal uh, with, the, with the FIO, and it's actually really helpful um, because it's very difficult to find these small medullary tumors. They can really be sort of hidden inside the adrenal. The adrenals can be buried in a bunch of fat, and so it can be technically very challenging. And so doing these sort of 3D models, I think, have really, really helped in terms of um, trying to figure out what you can spare and what you can't. And sometimes the, the tumor that you can um, save the cortex in is actually the, the larger one. So I think you really need to take a good look at those tumors and getting those 3D models can really be helpful. And I think most places now have that capability. So definitely talk to your radiologist and see if they can construct these models for you. And it's really, I think, very helpful for you and for the patient to find out you know, what, what to do during surgery. Yeah, all great points. So, Paul, I think we probably need to uh, be respectful of the hour and, and, and wrap it up. But that yeah. was an awesome session, guys. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Kimberly, Rashri, and uh, Adi. That, that, those were great uh, case presentations. And thanks for the uh, comments from the, uh, from the uh, different uh, folks on the call. Um, we will be doing our ESU, uh, you know, right before the actual AES meeting in, um, in April. Uh, we also will have another, at least one, and possibly two additional other webinars, so just uh, stay tuned 
we'll send out uh, information uh, as it goes forward. But uh, yeah, looking forward to spending time with you all, um, you know, full day uh, right before the AES meeting. Paul, thank you so much for organizing this. This is a highlight of every year of uh, kind of our fellows education program. And I was glad to like integrate it with our other EST webinars. I think this will be just a standing thing going forward. We'll probably even do it a couple of times a year uh, next year. So thanks everyone for your uh, attendance tonight and uh, see you soon. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, everyone. Great. Good event. night, everyone. Stay well. Goodness sakes. Okay, I still need to learn how to exit.